and then I would like to introduce my friend Joran Zuri to start his speech. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Tassir, and good morning. Bonjour. Uh, you've heard most of my French vocabulary. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here for many, many reasons, including the many people that I have had an opportunity to work with over the years, including uh, people from all over the world and, and many of my uh, former uh, doctoral students and graduate students. So it's always nice to be able to have this kind of a get together. Um, I think that it's important, uh, very important, and I want to congratulate uh, Tassir and Todd and the other people who worked on the development of this, uh, this Congress. I think that uh, Bob Sternberg said it all yesterday at the end of his speech when he said, there are many, many problems facing our world, our cultures, our societies, as more and more people live on this tiny planet Earth. And uh, it will only be through creative ideas that we'll be able to solve these problems. And I think as an educator, uh, one of the things that I hope to be able to see happen in my lifetime is that more and more of what young people do in school uh, develops their creative talents. I'm going to uh, try to cover two things this morning. Uh, some of these keynotes. background material, the theory and research underlying this new program uh, called Renzulli Learning. I always apologize at the beginning. I did not name the program myself. It was named by the University of Connecticut, which owns the program. And um, so uh, I'm going to go over a little bit of the background, and then I'm going to go over the actual uh, components of uh, how the program works. Uh, people oftentimes ask, uh, I was thinking of this last night actually, as Bob was talking, where do ideas come from? And um, this idea came from a number of different places, but a lot of it started about eight years ago when I was uh, up in the state of Vermont. That's a very famous uh, skiing state in the U.S. And I was riding on a chairlift uh, up the mountain with a stranger. And so we started talking and discussing things, and uh, I asked him where he was from. He said New York. I was, he, he asked me, Connecticut, uh, what do you do? I said, I'm a teacher. Uh, what do you do? I'm a school principal, he said. Uh, what do you teach? I said, gifted and talented education at the University of Connecticut. And uh, he said, oh, we have a gifted and talented program in our school. And I said, well, tell me a little bit about it, which he did. <clears throat> and, um, then I said, uh, how do you go about identifying your children, the gifted and talented students? And he said, oh, we use this god-awful thing called the Renzulli rating scale. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then he, he said, and then after we do this rating scale, th this crazy man, Renzulli, then has the students fill out an interest Eliza a learning styles inventory, an expression styles inventory. This is what our teachers feel like. Uh, and um, one of my basic beliefs, and I don't think anybody here would disagree with me on this, is the more that we know about a young person, beyond just their cognitive abilities, their interests, their learning styles, their, my most recent work is an instrument. After the Frank Sinatra song, I did it my way. It's an expression styles inventory, how young people would like to express themselves. But I realized as that young, that man on the ski lift was talking about these, that I was really, in trying to get more information about young people to teachers, I, I was part of the problem. And so as soon as I, I finished skiing and got, was driving out of the mountains that day, I got on my cell phone and I called everybody I knew that knew anything about technology, which I did not know anything. And I said, can you meet me tomorrow morning, 9 o'clock? 
And, and actually what we started to do at that time was to take this mass, vast amount of information and to digitize it, to get it into some format that could be much more easily used by teachers. And so you'll see an example of that again as we move along. Now the story's not completely over. We reach the end of the ski lift and we ski down the ramp. Now, how do you get you to get someone to ask you your name? <laughs> you ask him his name. And I said, oh, by the way, what is your name? And he said, Tony Rendazzo. And he said, what's your name? And I said, oh, it's right here on my ski badge. <laughs> and he looked at it and <laughs> down, the, down the mountain he went. And so uh, where do ideas come from? Necessity. Necessity is the mother of, the uh, of invention, as long as you realize that you are wrong. Now, very quickly, uh, background information. All of my work is based on two theories. Uh, one is called the three-ring conception of giftedness, uh, developed in the, in the 1970s, where I said that we must look at more than just cognitive abilities. Uh, we must look at things like creativity and task commitment, or think of that as a very focused form of motivation. And it must be these three things interacting with one another. And I also believe that whereas cognitive abilities tend to remain constant in the study of human characteristics and traits, creativity and task commitment are very situational, which means we can develop those things in young people if we provide them with the right opportunities and resources and encouragement. The second part of my work is built around a <clears throat> theory uh, called the enrichment triad model, three different interrelated types of enrichment. Uh, type one is exposing young people to issues, ideas, topics, authors, names, dates, places, events that are not ordinarily a part of the regular curriculum, but if we do them, uh, expose young people to them in an exciting way, it might turn on the light bulb. It might get them interested in doing some follow-up. And in fact, that's one of the reasons why we see, see if I can get this to work, we see an arrow going from type one to type two or directly from type one to type three. Now, type two enrichment, and I'll go over some of this in a little more detail later, is basically uh, teaching young people a broad range of thinking skills, research skills, communication skills. And I'll give you some examples of that as we go along. The third part, and, and, and by the way, I've always argued in my work that type one and type two enrichment are good for all students. We ought to be doing them with all students and determining which ways and how positively some young people respond to those experiences and then that will lead them from type one or type two into type three, which is the highest part, individual and small group investigations of real problems. And I'll define what a real problem is in just a minute, but my favorite way of describing type three is the young person thinking, feeling, very important, and doing like the practicing professional, even if at a much more junior age than a senior scientist at a famous university or a filmmaker in Hollywood or an artist in Paris. They're doing what professionals do, just at a, at a at more junior level. So one of the challenges is, well, that you might raise with me is, well, how do you get them to do this? And this is what a lot of our, our work has been portée. Now, there are four characteristics of a type three. And uh, first of all, it is, there is a personalization of interest. You have selected the topic. Now think of the endless hours that young people spend in school from young age to university where the topic is selected by somebody else. So a type one experience, maybe having someone come in to do a, a, a demonstration on robotics might inspire one or two or a group of young people to want to go further. And so the purpose of a type one is an invitation, but the personalization of interest factor is very important. The second thing that makes a, a type three different from the usual ritualistic projects or papers that students do is that they're going to use authentic methodology. Again, they're going to do what the practicing professional does, even if at a more junior level. The third thing is that it's done for an audience other than, or at least in addition to the teacher. In other words, it's, it, there, it's, it's knowledge going someplace to make something happen. And so audience is a very important part of what makes a problem real. 
the fourth, is, the fourth characteristic of a type three is that there's no single predetermined correct answer or right way of doing it. There are many, many different ways that one could approach a different project. And of course, we want to get away from what regular school is all about, which is the right answer business. Now, in the 1980s, I teamed up with a partner. In fact, we teamed up so well that we now have four children. Uh, and what we did was we fashioned this into uh, an organizational plan called the school-wide enrichment model. And one of the reasons that we did this, although this work, the two theories at the top, were very popular in gifted education, we still felt that we were not giving many, many more youngsters exposure and opportunities to do advanced level work. And so, um, by the way, uh, Sally Reese, the, the, my partner and wife, and I will be doing uh, some full day workshops on the school-wide enrichment model uh, in pre uh, at the ETCHA conference in uh, September, if you're interested in that. Uh, our, uh, my, my mission is applying the pedagogy of gifted education to enrichment opportunities for all students. Some of my critics have said, I have said all children are gifted. I've never said that. I, I believe if I haven't written it, don't assume that I've said it. What I have said is that by giving more children opportunities in, in the regular curriculum and in purposefully designed types one and two, we can see more light bulbs turn on, more young people getting interested. Uh, so our, our uh, mission, I believe, is a rising tide lifts all ships. As we make school better for any one child or any group of children, we also, it's very contagious. There's a radiation that takes place. When these children here see these children working on an exciting project or doing research or doing some original art or poetry, then it's going to inspire other kids. In fact, one of the things that I recommend is that you decorate the school environment with many, many examples of great work done by young people. We can always hang a picture of Descartes on the wall, or we can always hang a picture of some uh, Leonardo da Vinci, but if kids see the work of other young people, it's very inspiring to them. This is a little bit based on Bandura's theory of self-efficacy. So that, in, in a shorter period of time, is the last 35 years of my life. Now, uh, when the University of Connecticut approached me, the Research and Development Corporation, and they said, you know, we think you've got a pretty good thing going. We would like to be able to commercialize this. It is a commercial program, although pr the profit, besides investors, that goes to the university ends up in our research money foundation, our research foundation. And so I don't profit from this personally, but I have opportunities to do more research. So we started working again, the usual process, field tests, trials, research, and we ended up developing this. And I'm gonna go over this in detail. We, we look at a profile of the individual strengths of the youngster. And again, whenever I say strengths, always think beyond cognitive ability as Bob pointed out so well last night. Then um, a search uh, uh, databases, 14 different databases that are based on the theory. Now remember you heard me uh, talk a minute ago about audience and outlet. Well, if you could see this uh, up close, you'll see that one of our databases, uh, it's up about there, is, is contests and competitions or places where, for example, young people can submit their work for publication. So, one of my concerns in developing this is I didn't want another worksheets online. I didn't want another encyclopedia online. Monsieur, nous devons être plus porteurs collectivement. Online. I wanted a program that had theoretical integrity to the triad model. And so there was a lots of discussion about making sure that the program did have this kind of integrity. Um, for each youngster that uses the program, everything that she or he does is stored in an electronic portfolio. The teachers can view it, use that information to make decisions. We've now had some places are even using it to help youngsters make college decisions by looking at the work that they've done and the kind of material that they might want to submit or include in their letters of application to college. Um, another part of the program is um, the, uh, what we call the wizard project maker. 
originally in triad, as my friend Don Treffinger will remember, that was the management plan for type three enrichment that helps a youngster lay out a project from stating a hypothesis or a research question or a creative product that they would like to develop and it takes them all the way through to outlet audience and impact upon audience. Again, we'll cover some more of this as we move along. Um, one of my favorite quotations comes from a very famous American playwright, Tom Stoppard. Um, you can't open a door unless you have a house. And one of the things that I believe is that if we're going to develop giftedness and creativity in young people, we have to have a plan or a model. Otherwise, it, it, the program is going to be a mishmash of things that actually sometimes compete with one another. Uh, you, you heard the old cliche, if you don't stand for something, you're liable to fall for anything. And so I, I very much believe that there must be this kind of organizational plan and theoretical integrity. Now in the US, and this is not unlike what's happening in many countries around the world, there's been an overemphasis on preparing young people to take tests. I think that the reason that so much of our curriculum is memorization and practice is because of the, the, the over in, overly important role that tests play in our society. One of the things that we found in our work is that we can actually improve achievement test scores through an enrichment-oriented approach. And I'll share some of that research with you a little later on, including a research study that was done using the Renzulli Learning Program in a control, very highly controlled situation. But one of the, th oh, just um, one thing that sort of is a, a guide that I try to live my life by, and that is theory-based, research-supported, and practice-proven. I think that that's the way to get practices into schools that will have an impact. Um, one of the things that we found is that en engagement, enjoyment, and enthusiasm do in fact lead to higher achievement. We don't have to use just drill and practice to promote higher levels of achieve achievement. Um, this next item is intended to get a laugh, but it's for a U.S. audience, but I'll, I'll give you enough information so I hope you'll laugh. Uh, we have a president in the United States, thank goodness his, his days are waning, uh, <laughs> who, who developed an education uh, policy called No Child Left Behind, NCLB, um, No Teacher Left Standing. Um, and um, we, in fact, base our work on, and by the way, it's very criticized by just about everybody in the education, in the U.S. Nobody likes it. But we've based our work on NCLB, but we have a little variation on it. No child left bored. I believe that if we do some of these kinds of things, and you'll see examples as we move along, as we do some of these kinds of things, then we can avoid what's happening, especially, especially to our most able young people. Uh, you've seen this perhaps before, but we see the brighter the student, the more bored they are with what is happening in so many of their classrooms. Now, I'd like to spend a minute telling you something that you already know, you just haven't thought about lately. And uh, to do this, uh, I'm gonna use, uh, I'm Italian, so I talk with my hands. I'm going to use my Italian audiovisual audio aids, okay? All learning, and when I say all learning, I mean from diapers to doctorate, exists on a continuum. And that continuum ranges from deductive, didactic, prescriptive, all the way over to investigative, in, indu inductive, and in inquiry oriented. Now, unfortunately, in far too many schools, we emphasize this, and again, No Child Left Behind in the U.S. has forced more deductive, didactic, prescriptive learning. And so one of the kinds of things that's a part of the mission of my work and the work of many of my colleagues here in the audience uh, and, and other places is to try to get more of this kind of uh, work into, uh, this kind of learning into schools. And so here we see just a very simple comparison. You see the theories, the major theorists there. Uh, sometimes called the gold standard. What's the, what's the national goal or outcome of inductive investigative? 
Basically, that's to create more inventors, creative designers, entrepreneurs, innovative leaders, the kinds of people that make and change the world, that change entire businesses and industries. Think of the number of people that Bill Gates has put to work with, with his ideas, the number of people that have been put to work in, in, in the invention of the most simple things. In Connecticut, we have a company called BIC, and they make ballpoint pens. Think of the number of people, not just the people that make the pens, the, the advertisers, the people that write the, the uh, uh, d uh, advertisements, the people that drive them in their trucks to stores, the salespeople that sell them. Just one idea creates an economy, and that's why this is so important. Now, I, I'm going to bore you with one little other little tiny bit of theory, if you don't mind. Um, by the way, I love this quotation from Samuel Johnson. Knowledge is of two kinds. We know a subject ourselves, or we know where we can find information upon it. Now, when I went to school, and some of you are, are my age, but not quite, um, the source of all knowledge came from two places, either from teachers or textbooks. And that's no longer t true today. Any child anywhere in the world that can plug one of these computers into a wall outlet can get any different kind of information that they want in the entire world. And so I think our, our whole approach to learning, why do we have to memorize all of this information when it is so quickly and easily available? Now I'm only going to spend a minute on this next diagram, the theory of knowledge that underlies my work. In the top of this cube, we see all of the knowledge that is in the world. Every bit of knowledge in the world is right there, very broadly classified, I might add. That would be all of the, all of the libraries of the world or a very large computer chip. Listed on the face of the cube are the ways that knowledge is organized. And I think that we've spent too much time in education dealing with just factual information and a few other things, categories, etc. <laughs> One of the things that we have all spent almost no time on is teaching young people how to become investigators. Remember, thinking, feeling, and doing like the practicing professional, how do we do that? Now, one other item that I'm going to uh, indicate, knowledge is divided into two kinds. You see on the right-hand side of the diagram. The first kind is what I call TBP, or to be presented knowledge. And that's the course outline, that's what's in the textbook, that's what teachers are required to teach. Uh, however, in this modern age, 21st century learning, especially with the availability of the internet, we also have to teach young people how to use what I call JIT, or just-in-time information. And I'll try to give some examples of that as we move along. But a youngster might be working on a project in a particular area where they need to have, let's say, the weather data, the amount of rain, snow, fall, temperature changes in the city of Paris for the last 50 years because they're trying to predict what the future climate will be. Well, that would be totally irrelevant if you taught it in a regular science class, wouldn't it? Who would want to pay attention to that? But a young person that's doing this climatological study, that becomes very important. They can find that information through internet resources. The, I want to go back now, though, for one moment to this uh, investigative um, methodology. One of the things that we have built into the Renzulli Learning System is a database we call how-to books. And these are books that teach youngsters how to go about investigating in particular areas. And we have them in every subject area, literally. I'll, I'll illustrate one or two in a minute. But here we see plays for young puppeteers, how to make pop-up books, the animator's handbook, how to debate, a favorite of mine, student's guide to social action, uh, public speaking, the kid's business book, the art and craft of playwriting, uh, you're going to see a little girl that used this book, How to Write a Poem, and this book, in a little while, you'll see a little video of her, How to Get Published, and it goes on and on. My Backyard History Book, Archaeology for Kids, and more and more and more. So what we're trying to do is give young people the skills that are necessary to become first-hand investigators. I'm sorry I had to do that so fast, but the clock is ticking. Um, now. 
uh, I want to spend just a minute on type 2 enrichment and the way that we've approached this is to examine many, many different kinds of thinking skills, materials, or teaching strategies. If you were to read everything ever written about uh, thinking skills and then you tried to sort it into piles, you would arguably come out with piles that cover those several areas. And so one of the things that we've tried to do in our work in, in Zuli Learning is to use this uh, schematic to make sure that we cover a diversity of thinking skills, that we don't want 500 creative thinking skills activities in the databases, but no critical thinking activities in the databases. Now, I want to, this slide's a little out of order, but I want to go back to the how-to book and just take you through one example. This book is called Eyewitness to the Past. And what it does, it's a history book, but there's no names of generals or battles or anything like that in it. It teaches kids how to do historical investigation. And I think I only have maybe one or two um, examples from this book, but I, maybe two. Um, and so, for example, this is a photo analysis worksheet. A young person looks at a photograph and learns how to analyze it. Is it, uh, is it come from a conservative? There's also one for cartoons, for other documents, for family, even family um, uh, scrapbooks. Uh, who was the favorite child in the family? Did that child go on to have more advantages in life? Because they were always front and center in the picture. In this one, looking at a photograph, uh, what is the order of prominence of the person? Who is the person that the photograph is, fo is focused on? Who's in the background? There are a dozen or so, maybe more. This is an advertisement analysis worksheet. Who, who is this appealing? Today in America, they're selling cars on television all the time. But when the ad comes on, you see a very attractive, sexy young lady in a short skirt because that, they know, draws attention to the buying range, which in the people that buy certain kinds of cars at certain ages. And so these are the kinds of things that one learns. And so we've put a lot of these into our program. This is slightly out of date, but we have about 542 creative thinking skills activities, uh, over eight, almost 900 critical thinking activities, and about 200 of these how-to books, like the one that I just showed you. Now, the other thing, if you want young people to think and feel and do like the practicing professional, you also have to teach them some basic research skills. And so one of the things that we do is try to teach them these skills, but we don't try to do it by just listing the steps in research. Um, I don't know if this will work here in, in uh, Paris, but uh, in the U.S. we have things that are sold in the stores that are called antibacterial soap. Do they have those in, in where you live? Uh, are they better than just plain old bar soap or kitchen soap for getting bacteria off of your hands? How many say yes, they're better? Show of hands. One person. Uh, how many say, no, they're not? Many people. Uh, how many don't give a damn? <laughs> okay, last question. How many say, in all honesty, I don't know? Very good. What we have here, now you're all sixth graders, you're all 12 years old, okay? What we have here, if I can make this interesting enough to you, is a research question. We can do a study on this. All we need is this little instrument. It's called the glow germ meter. And you put some powder on your hands, and then you can determine the amount of bacteria. But one of the things I can do is teach kids so many, many other different research skills. For example, control variables. Have you ever said to your children, go wash your hands for dinner? Now, little Freddie goes in, and he's back out the door, 30 seconds. And uh, Susie goes in, and she's heard that you have to sing happy birthday three times. And so, now, the only thing is Susie forgot to use soap. So you see, in, if we, I'm going to do a research study on, control, on, on touching things to see if there's germs on them. I know Bob Sternberg left some germs on this microphone from last night. <laughs> then I have to control cleanliness. Now, what I have to have? One liter of water, and I can measure it for the temperature. So it's the same for you and for me. 
three dabs of soap. Now that's not perfect. It wouldn't fly in a, in a, in a Harvard laboratory, but it's close enough, again, at a junior level. And then a, somebody timing that you wash your hands for 30 minutes, 30 seconds, or one minute, whatever. Now we've controlled that variable. Now I take children out on the playground. This is one of my examples. And what they're doing with the glow germ meter is they're examining commonly touched things on the playground to see the amount of germs or bacteria on them. So here they're doing the handle on the trolley. Here they're doing the, the railing on the playscape. I don't know if I'd like to do this next one, but somebody has to do it. They're looking at the seat of the thing. So one of the things that we do in our training with teachers is we have a thing which we call the instrument lab. And here are some of the instruments in the lab. And we teach teachers how to use these in sort of uh, mini research situations. We even give them some research projects to get that they can get started on. Once the youngster learns, think of this as the arrow going from type two to type three. Once the youngster learns how to use the instrument, certainly not all of them, but one or two or several of them might want to then design their own research study. So that's how type three, type two can also inspire type three. Uh, it's based on a wonderful cliche. If you give a child a hammer, she or he treats everything in the world as if it were a nail. Exactly. So teach a child how to use that instrument and they may then want to go out and do an investigation. So that's also a part of what we've tried to build in Turinzuli learning. Uh, now, the system, a very quick overview. We've already done this and so I'm going to uh, move along to one other, a couple of other concepts. This next concept I call the Tower of Babel. Um, someone asked me, how does Renzulli learning differ from the internet? If you go home tonight and open up your computer and go to Google and put in the word Egypt in the search box, you will get 400, whoops, I skipped a slide here, excuse me. You will get 411 11 million hits related to Egypt. And some of them, it would take you half a lifetime to find good things for young people that you teach, and you'd have to take their age into consideration. And believe me, there are some things in there about ancient Egyptians that you don't want your children to see. Um, it, what we've done in Missouri Learning using what we call potential des élèves, du potential des enfants. People study thousands of items and then pick ones that meet certain criteria. First of all, they are safe for children. There is nothing there that would be offensive to young people. The second thing that we've done is we've tried to make sure that they are interactive, that it's not just information giving. I think I have an example of this somewhere on here where children actually can dissect their own mummy online. Uh, thirdly, we wanted them to be uh, varying levels of complexity so that kids that are brighter can go to, on to more advanced things, and we've categorized them. And in the U.S., because of federal pressures, thanks to, again, George Bush, we also have had to tie them to what we call state standards. So you'll see examples of some of this as we move along. So if you go to Renzulli Learning, you'll find about 100 results, but everyone has been carefully classified, vetted, and examined. So here, for example, is uh, you can find one at the Oriental Institute of Chicago. It's called Fun with Mummies. It gives a very brief description. If you like the description, you click on the blue line there, and what comes up is a simulation of actually dissecting your own mummy. Here we see the student is going to use the, uh, I'm pointing at my screen as if you can see it. They're going to use the hook. They're going to take the brains out through the nose. They're going to put them in a jar. They're going to label them. Then they're going to use the scalpel, um, which is second down there. And they're going to remove certain organs. Then they're going to, to uh, use certain chemicals to preserve them. And then eventually they wrap them and, and coat them with different material. And that's how mummies are made. That's what I call high engagement learning, rather than just simply reading that out of a book and forgetting it uh, very shortly. So that's a little bit about the trying to avoid this program being the Tower of Babel. 
We have about 30,000 uh, sites in our databases. Uh, we will probably level off at about 50,000. I don't want more than that. Otherwise, we will become a small tower of Babel. Um, now, oh, here, here's the next step in the mummification. You see that the student has made a little slit there to take out a certain organ, and then they go in different jars, and they're all labeled. Now, um, Uh, this is the home page. There is a page for students. There's a page for teachers. There's a page for parents. Parents at any time can view the work of their children. They can look at their profile. They can't change anything, but it's a view only. And then there's also a page for program managers. They can determine, for example, uh, what are the most preferred activities, uh, which teachers are not using it enough that might need some more training, things like that. So. Uh, we're going to start with the profiler, and um, here we see, again, the areas that we cover, uh, interest, learning styles, expression styles, and we ask children if they view themselves as being average, above average, or below average in each of the major subject areas. And all of this material is done at the keyboard. It's all point and click. There's no, no keystroking uh, that goes on. Uh, we have an easy read for uh, young children. We also have a, a Spanish language edition. Uh, the easy read. Uh, for younger kids, we use this little happy face thing. This is the standard one, my interest areas. Um, and they just point and click on each of those. Uh, this is uh, abilities. And out of the computer comes this profile. Uh, Doug is a fifth grade student who has special interest and abilities. Uh, primary interest appears to be in athletics. Second is in video, video photography, uh, and so on. Uh, first learning style is independent study. Second choice is um, lecture third choice is in learning games and it goes on like that so we get the top three interests uh, and areas and learning style areas for each youngster um, now what happens next is the most i think innovative part of the program uh, thanks to some computer people that do things that i don't understand what happens is the computer then searches through these databases, 30,000 plus, and it finds activities just for Doug. And it puts them into his portfolio, and he can go to those activities. And so what we can do for the first time is let the computer do the hard work of matching resources to young people. Now, I think a, 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 you'll see some of this as we move along. But I think that one of the ways to understand this is to meet uh, someone who's actually used it. Her name is Valerie, and she will tell you about her experiences. Is this is on? Yeah. Okay. So meet my little friend Valerie. Valerie, this, was, this uh, video was made three years ago. Valerie has now had five poems published nationally. 
Um, she is planning to do a major in, she's still in high school, but she, she was in uh, middle school when this happened, but she plans to do a major, uh, hopefully at Yale. Can you write a letter for her, Bob? Uh, uh, in uh, English literature, she has had 25 poems uh, on the internet, on different internet sites. You see the, the audience issue that comes into play here, and she, you, Hear one of Valerie's poems? Uh, if you're using this program, you can, figuratively speaking, push a button and get all the children in your class or grade or school that are interested in, the, in poetry. But this teacher wanted not common interests, but complementary interests. She wanted kids that were interested in history and photography and um, media design and World War II and Vietnam. So she looked at her children and she put together a group at, that is built around a poem that Valerie wrote. So let's meet Valerie and her friends. What it means to be a veteran. A man boarding a boat, waving to his wife. He may never see her again. This may end his life. He feels the boat take off. He's headed on his way. His daughter starts to cry. Why did daddy go away? His family is getting smaller. Now they look like ants. As they disappear, he gets one last glance. What is lying ahead for him? Will he live to tell the tale? As he approaches the dock, he hears a soldier wail. War is horrible. It is death. Man killing his own brother. Is that what we're on earth for? Just to kill one another? This man is a veteran. He made it through it all. Although he lost an arm, he still stands strong and tall. He made it through the terror, thinking he would die. He made it through the killing and the late nights when he would cry. He made it through missing his wife and family self. He made it through not being able to see his daughter grow. He sacrificed his life to protect the USA. He put himself in danger every single day. When it comes to protection, veterans are the key. This man is a hero. That's what a veteran means to me. So that's, that's a kind of an example of the program in action. One group of youngsters just studied uh, photography. In fact, this is at a school where we were doing research on the program. One young man came up to me and said, see this picture, Mr. Et je voudrais rendre un hommage appuyé. Photograph of World War II. Uh, the first one being the, uh, for my American colleagues, the Iwo Jima battle marker. The second one being the sailor kissing the girl in Times Square. And the third one was that soldier it said that uh, his picture was in this. And they had discussions. Well, we have to have World War I representation, and we have to have Vietnam representation. And they talked about the music, and they argued, no, you're making the music too loud. It's drowning out Valerie. And all of these kinds of personal skills, what I call intelligences outside the normal curve, working cooperatively with others, respecting other people's opinions, all of those things are mixed in and come into play as we do these kinds of things. And again, so much of the information here is based on technology. When it comes to audience, they presented this many places, but a very touching experience for me is that I went to the school the night that they presented this to the, the New England Vietnam Veterans Parce que je considère really bearded, beard, hairy guys came roaring into the parking lot on their motorcycles and when they, there was other things being presented, but when they saw this, there was not a dry eye in the house. 
And so I think impact, did this thing achieve its goal? Impact upon audience, touching people in their hearts, which is very important. So that's a little bit about what this learning, type of learning is all about. Now here on the screen, we see the various databases. And um, when um, we look at materials, we figure out where they, they fit. We also classify them. Uh, here you see they're classified by interest area, by learning style, by expression style. We do use grade and ability level. You can't be very rigid on this. Most of that's done with readability formulas that we look at the vocabulary and say that this is more reading level of uh, young, younger children, middle school children. We're not, we don't get off the deep end on 